Ladies and gentlemen, I thank Daniel Hampton, Acting Director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, for the honor to deliver the keynote address at this year's Emerging Security Sector Leaders Seminar. The decision to accept this invitation was not a difficult one to make, as it was brought to my attention directly by my National Security Advisor, Brigadier General Retired Emmanuel Ochre, who is an alumnus of the center. So as you can see, I had very little choice in the matter. The fight to enhance security in Africa is a major priority of the contemporary global agenda, which we must collectively embrace. And I therefore heartily applaud the Africa Center for Strategic Studies for this vision and initiative. And congratulate also the security officers drawn from across the continent for being chosen for this important program. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is that peace, freedom, and prosperity walk in tandem. I might add that respect is often the unstated but constant companion of peace, freedom, and prosperity. And wherever these three go, respect always follows. When a country is peaceful, free, and prosperous, it is respected. If the African continent is to take its rightful place in the world, it has to shed its image of instability and overcome the wars that have plagued us for so long. Those who seek to play meaningful leadership roles in Africa would necessarily have to prioritize the establishment of a peaceful atmosphere on the continent. The people's of the African continent are vibrant, even loud people, and long may that continue. I'm talking about taking advantage of the dynamism and the youthful exuberance of the people to build the orderly and prosperous societies that promote peace. I'm talking about building the free societies that promote the spirit of competition, and at the same time, recognize that there will always be some that require the safety nets provided by humane and civilized societies. It will be a good idea to look briefly at some of the issues that cause instability in many African countries. If we are able to identify clearly what causes the unrest and wars on our continent, it would naturally be easier to find solutions. For us in Ghana, Political instability described much of the early decades of our life as an independent nation. And we became notorious for sampling every and any type of political experiment. The instability instigated the collapse of the economy and led to the exodus from the country of many citizens and professionals. We are probably not still recovered from the tendency to want to leave the country as the answer to difficult situations. I'm happy to state, though, that for the past 29 years of our Fourth Republic, we've enjoyed political stability under a multi-party constitution and the longest period of stable constitutional governance in our hitherto tumultuous history. The separation of powers is now a real phenomenon in Ghanaian life, promoting accountable governance. Efficient public services are now within reach. We have in this period experienced through the ballot box the transfer of power from one ruling political party to another on three occasions in conditions of peace and stability without threatening the foundations of the state. The Ghanaian people have manifested in this era their deep attachment to the principles of democratic accountability, respect for individual liberties, human rights, and the rule of law. It has also brought with it more or less systematic 
economic growth and boosted immensely our self-confidence. We have not got to this stage easily and without difficulties. If I were pressed, I would mention in particular the electoral process as the greatest source of potential instability. The trigger for many wars and disputes around the continent can be traced to dissatisfaction with the conduct of elections. We know that the electoral process remains for many African countries one of the weak links that pose security threats to our democracies and the stability of our governance. Fortunately for us in Ghana, the work of the Electoral Commission has systematically improved to the extent that the general elections of 2020, the eighth successive one in the period of Ghana's Fourth Republic, was one of the best organized elections, if not the best, in our history, which won universal acclaim. The Electoral Commission, even in the face of the pandemic, embarked on a very transparent voter registration exercise which captured some 17 million persons on the electoral register, representing 94% of the potential electorate to the satisfaction of all the political actors. And thereafter, conducted polls which saw the Ghanaian people turning out in large numbers, with the nation recording a 79% turnout, one of the highest in the democratic world. The high rates of adherence to COVID-19 protocols on the day ensure that the exercise passed off safely, just as was done in the aftermath of the 2012 elections. The results of the 2020 elections were finally settled in court and not on the streets. After the losing presidential candidate, the fourth president of the republic who had lost the 20 elections, 2016 elections as an incumbent expressed reservations, which were subsequently unanimously rejected by the Supreme Court as baseless. The quality of the Electoral Commission's work has contributed significantly to the maintenance of peace and stability in Ghana. We have also in recent times witnessed threats to peace on the continent in the form of unconstitutional changes in government. Indeed, according to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, 18 African leaders have either modified or eliminated constitutional term limits in the past two decades. In addition, another eight resisted efforts to institute term limits bringing the number of countries lacking constitutional restraints on the tenure of executive power to 24. This represents almost half of the number of countries on the continent. These developments, together with a number of other factors, have unfortunately resulted in coup d'etats on the continent. As current chairperson of the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State and Government, I have seen directly the devastating effects the coup d'etats and attempted coups have had on the region. There have been at least three such occurrences in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, and an unsuccessful attempt in Guinea-Bissau. The reappearance of coups in Africa in all its forms and manifestations must be condemned by all, since it seriously undermines our collective bid to, read, to rid the continent of the menace of instability and unconstitutional changes in government, as currently defined by the frameworks established in the Lome Declaration, the African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Governance, and other important regional and continental instruments. Unconstitutional regime changes retard a country's growth. But ladies and gentlemen, 
there is nothing quite as potentially toxic on the African continent as the problem of job creation. Some of the statistics are both frightening and full of promise. The World Bank tells us that in 40 African countries, over 50% of the population is under the age of 20. Indeed, the median age across the continent is stated to be 19.5 years. That is a lot of young people who would all be needing jobs. That is also a lot of young energy that can be mobilized to the development of the continent. However, widespread poverty and disillusionment amongst youth in Africa are not only providing fertile breeding grounds for these youths who want to cross the Sahara Desert on foot and the Mediterranean Sea in rickety boats in the hope of finding a better future outside the continent, but also for a new generation of terrorists. This is exceptionally worrying because surrogates of Al-Qaeda in the Sahel and Boko Haram militants operating around the Lake Chad Basin, the two most active terrorist groups in West Africa, prey on the unacceptable levels of poverty in these areas, in the recruitment and indoctrination of youth. Additionally, the growing numbers of breakaway terror groups, in addition to our natural vulnerabilities, notably the spread of ethno-linguist groups and the porous nature of our borders, call for regional and continental approaches to contain the grave threats of terrorist and extremist activities. As leaders in Africa, we must be seen to be creating opportunities and jobs for our youth. Firstly, through education. We have as a matter of great urgency to open opportunities of education for all our youth. We're told that 89 million young Africans of school-going age are not in school. That has to stop and stop now. In Ghana, at great cost, we've instituted a system of free secondary education, which has brought in a total of 1.6 million students currently into senior high school, the highest enrollment in our history. We believe that the cost of providing free secondary education will be cheaper than the cost of, an, of the alternative of an uneducated and unskilled workforce and has the capacity to retard our development. Secondly, with the majority of the continent's economies dependent on the production and export of raw materials, who can blame our youth for wishing to leave in search of greener pastures elsewhere or becoming targets of recruitment? by terrorists. We cannot continue traveling this worn path of limited success of being exporters of raw materials. We have to embark urgently on the structural transformation of our economies. The only way to ensuring prosperity for our populations in Africa is through value addition activities. In other words, through industrial development with modernized agricultures and transformed and diversified economies. We must rapidly leave behind the old economies and embrace the technological and digital potential of the new modern economies and thereby give opportunities, jobs, and hope to our young people to live dignified, productive lives. Thirdly, through good governance. It is important 
that we promote and develop on the continent a system and culture of accountable governance, free of corruption, where our by our people are governed in accordance with the rule of law, respect for individual liberties, human rights, and the principles of democratic accountability. Such a system includes building strong institutions of state, such as well-resourced parliaments and judiciaries, efficient law enforcement agencies, and, inf and effective security forces that see their responsibilities and allegiance to the wider public interest, not just to the conveniences of the government of the day. In addition to these, and to help confront the security challenges facing Ghana, we have launched a national security strategy, which is serving as the pivot around which Ghana's national security revolves. The strategy has the potential to consolidate further Ghana's position as the most peaceful country in West Africa and Africa. It is strengthening state response to current and future threats while enhancing our prevention, protection, and response capabilities at national and regional levels. I'm certain that if we set our hearts and minds to this, and focus our energies on implementing successfully the strategy, we shall succeed in creating a more cohesive, inclusive, peaceful, progressive, prosperous, stable, and united Ghana. We need to have peace in Africa to deal with the debilitating problems of poverty. As they say, l'argent n'aime pas le bruit. Money does not like noise. And indeed, we would all agree that where there is chaos, where there's noise, where there's unrest, we are not likely to find money or the widespread prosperity that will enable the long-suffering masses of Africans to live lives of dignity. If we are going to build prosperous countries, we should have peace. And those who would lead Africa must cherish and seek peace. I believe strongly that despite her numerous challenges, Africa is on the cusp of building a great new civilization, which will unleash the considerable energies and huge potential of the African peoples, so that we will make our own unique contribution to the growth of world civilization. God bless Mother Africa and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention.